On today's episode, we continue our journey through Grimm's fairy tales with the Twelve Brothers. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast where we dig into the fairy tales and folk tales that inspired all the stories that we know and love today so that we can appreciate just how batshit crazy all of these original folk tales and fairy tales are. So this week's episode, we continue our journey through Grimm's fairy tales with a story called The Twelve Brothers. Let's get right into it. No wasted time here. All right. The Twelve Brothers. Once upon a time, there was a king who had twelve children, all boys. Moreover, he didn't want to have a daughter and said to his wife, If you give birth to our thirteenth child and it's a girl, I shall have the twelve boys killed. However, if it's a boy, then they'll all remain alive and stay together. So we're just a few sentences in and we already have an insane ultimatum. Zero to one hundred immediately. Let's do it. The queen thought of talking him out of this, but the king refused to hear anything more about this topic. King is resolute. He says, if everything turns out like I said, they must die. I'd rather chop off their heads myself than let a girl be among them. The queen was sad about this because she loved her sons with all her heart and didn't know how she could save them. Finally, she went to the youngest, who was her favorite, and revealed to him what the king had decided. "'Dearest child,' she said, "'go into the forest with your eleven brothers. Stay there, and don't come home. One of you should keep watch on a tree and look over here toward the tower. If I give birth to a little son, I'll raise a white flag on top of the tower. However, if it's a little daughter, I'll raise a red flag. If you all see that it's red, then save yourselves.' Flee into the wide world, and may our dear Lord protect you. I'll get up every night and pray that you won't freeze in the winter, and are able to warm yourselves by a fire, and that when it's hot in the summer, you can rest in a cool forest and sleep. Maybe just give them some equipment so that they can deal with whatever environmental conditions they'll have to deal with, instead of just saying, I'll pray for you, good luck. Anyway, we continue. After she gave her blessing to her sons, they went out into the forest where they frequently looked toward the tower. One of them had to sit on top of a high tree and constantly keep watch. Soon a flag was hoisted, but it wasn't a white one. It was a blood-red flag that foreshadowed their doom. As soon as the brothers caught sight of it, they all became angry and cried out, Why should we lose our lives because of a girl? Then they all swore to remain in the middle of the forest and to keep on their guard, and if a maiden were to appear, they would kill her without mercy. Why, if a maiden were to appear, they would kill her without mercy? It's not the girl, it's not the little daughter that's going to come kill them. It's the king that's going to come kill them. Why would they be alarmed by a maiden? Also, presumably, people wander into the forest. They're not alone in this forest. They had access to the forest. Other people have access to the forest. They're just going to freak out if they see a girl. All right, I already see something bad is going to happen here. Pretty obvious, pretty unreasonable on the brothers' part. We continue. Soon after this, they searched for a cave where the forest was the darkest, and that's where they began to live. Every morning, eleven of the brothers went off to hunt. One of them had to remain home, cook, and keep house. Whenever they encountered a maiden, she was treated without mercy and lost her life. Come on, guys. I still don't know why they think that a maiden is the threat here. Did the mom not make it clear that it's the king who would be after them, and not the daughter that she's going to have? These poor maidens, we don't even get a number of how many they killed. That's how many it was, whenever they encountered a maiden. They make it seem like a somewhat common occurrence. This is how they lived for many years. Man. In the meantime, their little sister grew up and was the only child left at home. Probably pretty good that these brothers left if they are this ready to murder young girls. Anyway, one day there was a large amount of washing to do, and among the clothes there were twelve shirts for boys. 
Whose shirts are these? the princess asked the washerwoman. They're much too small for my father. Had they just not washed these boys' shirts for years? Why are they suddenly in the laundry? It was then that the washerwoman told her that she had once had twelve brothers, but they had mysteriously gone away. Nobody knew where, because the king had wanted to have them killed, and the twelve shirts belonged to the twelve brothers. Did nobody think to look in the forest where all of the maidens were disappearing? That didn't cause any kind of commotion or any red flags, no pun intended, to go up in the town? Girls keep going into the forest and getting killed? Meanwhile, these twelve brothers have disappeared? No one put that together? Anyway, we continue. The little sister was astonished that she had never heard of her twelve brothers, and during the afternoon, as the clothes were drying and she was sitting in the meadow, she recalled the words of the washerwoman. After giving considerable thought to what she had heard, she stood up, took the twelve shirts, and went into the forest where her brothers were living. Well, maybe if she puts on the shirts, they'll think she's a boy and won't kill her for being a maiden. The little sister made her way straight to the cave that served as her brother's dwelling. Straight to it. How does she know? How does she know where the cave is? Maybe there's been talk of the murder cave where no maidens ever return from. Eleven of them were out hunting, and only one of them who had to cook was at home. When he caught sight of the maiden, he composed himself and drew his sword. "'Kneel down! Your red blood will flow this very second, he cried. But the maiden pleaded, "'Dear sir, let me live. I'll stay with you and serve you honestly. I'll cook and keep house.' She spoke these words to the youngest brother, and he took pity on her because of her beauty and spared her life. Because of her beauty? Okay, it makes it a little creepy that he's sparing her life because he thinks she's hot when she's actually his sister. Don't like that detail. Don't like that at all. Later, when his eleven brothers returned home and were astonished to find a maiden alive in their cave, he said to them, Dear brothers, this girl came to our cave, and when I wanted to cut her to pieces, she pleaded for her life so much and said that she would serve us faithfully and keep house that I spared her life. I think they just don't want to do the washing and the cooking and the cleaning anymore. And she was definitely told already by someone in the town that people keep disappearing, that maidens specifically keep disappearing, because she was ready. She was ready for that, I'll cook and keep house and clean and everything like that, take care of everything. What about the twelve shirts she had? Did that not come up? She had twelve men's shirts. The brother didn't think to ask her, hey, why do you have a bunch of men's laundry? Also, I recognize that shirt. That's my shirt. Why do you have my shirt? Guess that didn't come up. Guess no one asked, and they just thought, oh hey, a girl with some clothes. Fantastic. The others thought that this would be a great benefit to them, because now all twelve of them could go hunting, and they were satisfied with this arrangement. They never thought this about the previous maidens. They never thought, hey, maybe we could get some other maidens. It's gotta get lonely, twelve dudes hanging out. These maidens keep wandering in, they never think, hey, maybe we could get a sort of forest village community going here. Instead of just murdering all the maidens, up until their sister showed up, and apparently she's so hot that they're like, all right, we'll let her in. Creepy, creepy. Then the maiden showed them the twelve shirts and told them that she was their sister. Okay, here we go. Indeed, they were all very happy about this and were glad that they hadn't killed her. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, presumably they just laughed that one off very casually. Why hadn't she led with that? Why did she hold that information back up until now? Lead with that. Say, I'm your sister and I just heard about all of this. Instead of hoping they don't kill you, and just wait for them to make a decision about whether or not they were going to kill her, and then tell them, oh, by the way, I'm your sister. Because there's no way she could hide these 12 shirts. 12 shirts. Old-timey, thick shirts. You're not going to be able to hide those. Anyway. Glad they were happy that they didn't kill her. Now the little sister took over all the household chores, and when the brothers went out hunting, she gathered wood and herbs, kept the fire going, made up the beds nice and white and clean, and did everything with zeal and without getting tired. Okay, alright, great. It does seem like kind of a shitty deal for her, though. She's going from being a literal princess to a cave maid. I guess she really wants to get to know her brothers. But now all of the kids are in the forest. 
What's going on with the king and queen now that all of their kids have disappeared? I also don't understand why the daughter was then allowed to live alone. He's going to kill all the sons just so that a daughter wouldn't be around his sons. How terrible are these sons? Well, I guess pretty terrible because they keep killing maidens. So actually, in hindsight, yeah, that was a good call from the king. He knew that they were bloodthirsty for maidens. He knew that if he had a daughter, these brothers were going to kill that daughter. So if he had a daughter, killed his sons because they're already a bunch of psychopaths, apparently. And it's better to kill 11 murderous psychopaths than let them just tear this poor daughter limb from limb. Actually, yeah, makes sense. King was in the right. Back to the story, we continue. One day when she was finished with all the work, she took a walk in the woods and came to a place where there were twelve large beautiful white lilies. Since they pleased her so much, she plucked all twelve of them. No sooner did she do this than an old woman stood before her. Oh, my daughter, she said, why didn't you let the twelve budding flowers just stand there? They're your twelve brothers. Now they've been changed into ravens and are lost forever. Oh, God. All right. We got a twist. Got a big twist. Completely out of nowhere, as often happens in these old folk tales. Let's see what goes on here. The little sister began to weep and said, Isn't there any way that I can save them? No, there isn't any way in the world except one that's so difficult you won't be able to rescue them. You must spend the next twelve years without speaking. If you say one single word, even if there's only an hour left, everything will be in vain, and your brothers will die that very moment. Well, the little sister responded by climbing a tall tree in the forest where she took a place. I guess that means she just hunkered down. She wanted to sit there twelve years without saying a word to free her brothers. You can't eat or do anything up in a tree, lady. Gotta come down from the tree occasionally. You need to eat, you need to drink, you need to bathe. It's a terrible plan. But it so happened that a king was out riding and hunting in the forest, and as he rode by the tree, his dog stood still and barked. So the king stopped, looked up, and was very amazed by the princess's beauty. He called to her and asked her whether she wanted to become his wife. Jesus, that's easy. So this king, apparently not her father, the king, some other king, I guess this forest is between two kingdoms, king goes riding, sees a hot lady in a tree, and immediately proposes. I'm guessing this king's kingdom is pretty bleak, if this is what he's working with, and he's so eager to marry a tree woman. Anyway, we continue. However, she remained silent and only nodded a bit with her head. So the king himself dismounted, helped her down from the tree, and lifted her up before him onto his horse. Then he brought her home to his castle. Apparently without any introductions or conversations whatsoever, a nod of the head isn't really the most enthusiastic acceptance of a marriage proposal, but I guess this king's just happy for what he can get. Again, his kingdom must suck. He brought her home to his castle. Meanwhile, the princess did not utter one word, and the king thought she was mute. They would have lived happily with one another if it hadn't been for the king's mother, who began to slander the young queen in front of her son. She's a common beggar that you've dug up from nowhere, and she's doing the most disgraceful things behind your back. Man. Since the young queen couldn't defend herself, the king was led astray and finally believed what his mother said. So he sentenced his wife to death, and an enormous fire was built in the courtyard where she was to be burned to death. Another twist. Twists galore in the Twelve Brothers, my goodness. Also, was the mom specific about what she was doing? Just says she's been doing disgraceful things. King says, okay, I guess she must die. Just take her back to the tree from which you found her. Spiteful king. Rash decisions, all round. And yes, this kingdom sucks. And for the record, this is the second time in just this first collection of Grimm's fairy tales where a mute girl is found in the forest by a king who immediately makes her his queen, 
and then people in the kingdom talk shit about the Mute Queen until the king believes them and condemns the Mute Queen to death. Because she can't defend herself. This is a weirdly specific trope in Grimm's fairy tales that I haven't seen anywhere else, and I can kind of understand why it's not that popular anymore. Even the sentence is the same, burning her at the stake. Moving on. Soon the queen was standing in the flames that grazed the fringes of her dress. One minute was left before the twelve years of her silence would be completed. There was a noise in the air, and twelve ravens swooped down into the courtyard. As soon as they touched the ground, they became twelve handsome princes who instantly put out the fire's flames and led their sister to safety. How did they put out the fire's flames? Did they just run in with their swords and start battering all of the sticks and the brush and all that away? Don't know how this would have looked. Probably ridiculous. We continue. Then she spoke once again and told the king how everything had happened and how she had to save her twelve brothers. Indeed, they were all pleased that everything turned out so well. Did it, though? Did it turn out so well? Now they had to decide what they should do with the evil mother-in-law. Well, they stuck her into a barrel full of boiling oil and poisonous snakes, and she died a ghastly death. The end. Seriously, that's the end. This one is insane. All right, okay. Let's go over this. Okay, this one is complicated as hell, and has a whole bunch of twists and turns, and really no arc whatsoever. So there's a king and a queen and 12 boys. They're gonna have another kid. The king says, if it's a girl, we gotta kill all the boys. Queen says no, but the king says, nope, if it's a girl, we can't have this girl with all the boys. We gotta kill the boys. And clearly, he knew that these boys loved killing maidens. And so if he has a daughter, they must die. And I think the queen's response was correct. Send them away. Go into the forest. Then again, she kind of just sent them away to terrorize anyone who lives in the forest. Or ventures into the forest at any time. Specifically maidens. So the brothers all go into the forest, and then they see the red flag, realize they can never come back, and apparently just decide to take their rage out on any maiden they can find. Because they're choosing to blame maidens for this issue, and not their asshole king father. And so they lived in the forest, killing any maidens they came upon for many years. Then the daughter grew up, found a bunch of shirts that didn't look like they fit her dad, who I guess was probably pretty fat, asked about them, found out about the brothers. I guess no one else talked about them, except this washerwoman, this gossipy washerwoman. And then she abandons the kingdom as well. She goes and finds them, is not murdered because she's attractive. Again, creepy detail, don't like that. But then they find this arrangement where they all just live together, happily, somehow. I would be trying to bring in maybe some maidens that they're not related to, if I were one of these brothers. But they seem happy, so this carries on for a while. Then this whole thing shifts. We think the story must be progressing towards how... Are they going to return to the kingdom? How are they going to rectify this situation between the brothers and the king? How are they all going to be a happy family in the kingdom again? But the story says, fuck all that. We don't need any resolution whatsoever to this story. We're just going to go on a whole new story. And so one day when the little sister just happened to come across 12 large, beautiful white lilies, she plucked them. And then just some random old woman, it just says an old woman. It doesn't say her mother, although the woman says, oh, my daughter. I guess this is just a sign of affection. But some random old woman comes out and says, oh, no, why did you do that? You should have let them just stand there. They're your 12 brothers. Now they've been changed into ravens. Because you plucked the lilies. We have not been led to believe that there is any sort of witchcraft or magic or anything whatsoever in this world up until this point this is completely out of nowhere by the way so many questions about this woman who is this old woman how did she know about the brothers to begin with why does she have lilies 
that somehow are intertwined with the fate of the brothers and can turn them into various animals. This lady is a total wild card. We could have a whole side story just based on this one lady, I feel like. What's her backstory? What's her background? That's a spin-off. That's its own thing. And then the little sister weeps and says, Isn't there anything I can do? And then the woman says, No, there isn't any way in the world except one that's so difficult you won't be able to rescue them. Which basically just means, yes, you just have to not say anything for 12 years. If I were the daughter, I wouldn't believe that. I wouldn't believe that she's being honest. I think I would think this is like a prank or a trick or something. That this is just, I would think that this is just some old woman that thinks kids talk too much and is taking it out on this maiden who picked her lilies. It sounds like something an asshole neighbor would do if some neighbor kid came into their garden and picked their flowers. They say, what did you do that for? Now your siblings are turned into ravens. You have to be quiet for 12 years to save them. Anyway, the little sister believes this without question. Well, I guess she can't ask a question because if she says anything, then the brothers will die. She just immediately climbs a tree and sits in the tree. Don't know how she eats or sleeps or anything. She's just a tree girl now, and that's how she'll handle the next 12 years. Because this is a great way to handle things, apparently. And now we're off and running on this completely new story that has nothing to do with the previous king trying to kill the brothers and banishing them. Not banishing them, just saying he's going to kill them. Queen says go make your own way. Anyway, so, anyway, the little sister is in this tree and some other king comes along. Maybe this king actually deposed her father as the king and took the throne from him. And that's why we can never get a resolution to the first story. Because after the little sister left, a bunch of shit went down in the kingdom and there was a change of the king. Anyway, girl's in the tree, king rolls up, says, hey, you're really attractive. Want to be queen? And she nods a little. You'd think she would at least give a smile if she really were accepting this offer. If you're the king and you ask someone to marry you and they just sort of nod a little... I, I wouldn't really jump into that relationship wholeheartedly. It would seem like she's being a little reluctant. I don't know if you want to get into all that. But King, he made the offer, and she technically accepted it with a little nod of the head. So they ride back on their horse, and that's where the awful, terrible mother-in-law comes into play. And apparently just doesn't really like the girl at all, and just starts talking shit. All over the place, saying she's a common beggar. Even though she actually is a princess, they don't know that, because she's been silent this whole time. And the queen just starts slandering her, eventually gets into the king's head that she's actually terrible, and apparently so terrible that she deserves the death penalty. At the very least, just release her back into the forest where you found her, she's done nothing wrong. But no, the king decides to sentence her to death. So as this young queen is standing in the flames, just that moment, the twelve brothers descend as ravens, and then transform from ravens into princes, and just break apart the fire underneath her, I guess? Presumably not getting burned in the process? So then she descends from the fire, and if you're the king, her starting to talk after she descends from the fire, that's gotta be a pretty surprising moment. You've just seen a bunch of ravens transform into princes and tear apart this fire, and now the girl who you married and thought was mute is explaining this elaborate situation. I don't know how you handle that. But apparently, according to the story, they were all pleased that everything turned out so well. Yeah, I guess at that point you just gotta be relieved that no one died. Except for all of those maidens in Act 1. It could have ended there with the words, everything turned out so well, but no. They decide to add two more sentences <laughs> where they decide what to do with the evil mother-in-law and what they do is stick her into a barrel full of boiling oil and poisonous snakes. Overkill. You don't need boiling oil and poisonous snakes. Presumably the boiling oil would kill the poisonous snakes. But yeah, in any event, she died a ghastly death. That is a direct quote. And she died a ghastly death. They don't even throw a and they all lived happily ever after at the end. The last words they say are, she died a ghastly death. Full stop, next story. Yeah, apparently they really needed to make sure we knew that, because these old folktales are nothing if not vengeful. So yeah, that is the Twelve Brothers. 
takes a few twists along the way, doesn't really come to a resolution, but damn is it a fun ride. So, what is the lesson? How do we parse through this? Okay. Well, I think the intended lesson, and I'm going to be generous here, I think the intended lesson here is family should stick together, maybe. Families should look out for one another. I, I think that's the intended lesson, and be honest with not one another. I can't think of any intended lesson here other than families stick together and should stand by one another. Because the little sister is clearly the hero of the story, and she is the one who goes out to rectify things with the boys, even though she doesn't really solve anything, she just lives with them now. And then she stands by them and is silent for 12 years until they can turn back into princes. I want them to go back to their father and mother, that kingdom. I want some sort of resolution there, assuming, of course, that this king who just boiled his mother in boiling oil and poisonous snakes isn't a king who actually deposed or killed their father, the king. In which case, we also would get a very interesting next act if they realized that that was the case. There's a lot going on there. But if that's not the case, then let's have them all ride back to the initial kingdom and have a nice reunion. If the king was initially worried that they were going to kill the young daughter, and that's why he was going to kill them, clearly they're not going to do that, so things should be fine. They should be able to all live together as a happy family. But we don't get an ending like that. We have to be satisfied with this mother-in-law getting super murdered in boiling oil and poisonous snakes. Because that's how these folk tales have to end. And so I think the real lesson of this story is you don't get the ending that you want, you get the ending you deserve. And the ending that we deserve is vengeful oil and snake murder, I suppose. And so I think that the real lesson here is fuck your happy ending. You don't get happy ending, you get crazy shit. And you know what? That's more fun. I'm gonna be honest, this is probably a more entertaining story than if it were just a nice, clean, oh, they all met up in the forest, and things were great, and then they went back to the king and queen, and all was well, and they lived happily ever after. No, I'm actually happier with this crazy, there's lilies, and then the sons are turned into ravens, and then this girl has to be quiet for a bunch of time, and then this king is like, hey, you want to get married? And she's like, okay, but then the mother-in-law says, she's awful, you should murder her, and then the king's like, okay, I guess so. And then a bunch of ravens turn into princes, save them, and they're like, all right, she's actually the bad one, so now let's murder her, except in an even worse way than you were going to murder the little sister. So then you get super murdered, and all is well. Or we don't know if all is well, because we don't even get any sort of happy ending. We just get the end on the murder. And you know what? That's fine. That's better. It's fine anyway. Fuck all these happy endings. That's the real lesson of this story. Fuck happy endings. Let's get weird with it. That is the lesson of this story. All right, so now let's adapt this. I mean, this is definitely a TV show. This is for sure like a Game of Thrones style TV show. You could get a few seasons out of this. There is so much just meandering, winding, weaving, twisting, turning. There's a lot going on here. You could have a lot of subplots and side plots. Yeah, you could get full seasons out of this show. And then you could spin it out from the end as well and do even more. So we're going to get the first king is F. Murray Abraham. Look him up if you don't know who he is. He's the one who's going to be like, these boys all got to die. I'm not even going to get into casting the 12 children. Too many. There's too many people to cast. All right, fine. I'll, I'll give it a go. Let's do the four Stranger Things boys. We'll start with them. They're the first four, probably the youngest four. And then we'll have the four brothers from Peaky Blinders. The Shelby brothers, they'll be the other four, and then the last four will be the boys from Entourage. <laughs> yeah, the boys of Entourage. Vinny Chase, E, Johnny Drama, and of course, Turtle. So those are the 12 brothers. We got the four Stranger Things kids, we got the four Shelby brothers, and yes, I'm including the little kid, Finn, the youngest brother, who like only became relevant in the later seasons, and is just sort of a dumb kid for the first ones. But in any event, and then lastly, Entourage. 
the entourage from the show Entourage. And now the initial queen, she will be... Hmm. This woman has had 13 children. It's a lot of kids. So who can play this world-weary queen who has seen so much and had so many kids? You know what? Let's go funny with it. Let's make it Melissa McCarthy, and she just doesn't even leave a bed. She just lays in bed, have it popping out kids all the time. She's very loving. She's a very loving mother. She pulls one of the boys and says, Hey, if this is a girl, you guys are going to die. So you got to get out of there to that forest. And they scamper on off and then become a forest clan. I would actually love just a couple episodes of the Stranger Things kids, the Shelby brothers, and the entourage from Entourage just living in the forest together, trying to make do while sporadically killing whatever women they come across. Yeah, let's do some stuff with that and check in with what's going on in the kingdom in the in the first few episodes as well. Because there's presumably lots of things going on with the kingdom. They're hearing about this clan of people who I guess they're not going to ever figure out is the sons. Maybe the king kind of knows, but he's nervous about it and he looks the other way. King F. Murray Abraham, he doesn't actually want to kill them because he knows that they're his sons. So he's like, all right, if they're out in the forest, they're not actually doing any harm except for, you know, the the maidens that they continually kill. But maybe no one's telling him about that. I don't know. Maybe that's part of the first few episodes as well. We've got the village police. I guess they're called, like, the King's Guard. I don't know what they're, they, they would be called in a medieval sense. The knights. The knights. Let's go with the knights. They're hearing about the maidens that aren't returning. I don't know why they, they wouldn't go out there and investigate. Maybe they do. And then we have to get this whole, maybe there's a confrontation with the, with the boys and this raiding party. That would be an exciting climax to an episode. Let's do that. I'm into that. Then we have the daughter coming to the picture. It's just a baby while we have all of the, all the stuff with the brothers in the forest going on. But then ultimately it becomes a daughter and that's going to be, why is there always like a young princess character? I don't know any young actresses. Let, let, let's go with Zendaya again. It's going to be Zendaya. And one day Zendaya hears from the washerwoman, Kristen Wiig. She's going to have Kristen Wiig play the washerwoman. Nice little cameo there. And then she's like, oh, I'm going to go take these shirts and find my brothers. They'll want these back, probably. Then she goes out, finds them. Things work out. They live together. Things seem to be going well. She picks a couple lilies. Twist! Everything comes to a screeching halt when she picks these lilies. And a woman who we'll have be... Helen McCrory. Rest in peace. Love Helen McCrory. Because she'd be a great sort of witchy character who would impart the gravity of the situation and really sell it. Because this is a ridiculous thing that's happening here. But Helen McCrory could pull it off. So she's the woman who says, Look what you've done. You've taken the lilies. Now your brothers are ravens. You gotta shut up for 12 years. And then Zendaya goes up the tree and sits there for an unclear number of years. Quite a nice montage of her going through life in the tree. Maybe it's a tree right above Helen McCrory's garden. And there's some interaction there, and Helen McCrory keeps her fed and safe and... I don't know what. But I like that. I like that dynamic. We get some mileage out of that. Maybe a whole episode out of that. And then another king shows up, rides up on his horse, and this will be King Michael B. Jordan. Because Michael B. Jordan is awesome, and we haven't used him in anything yet, I don't think. We may have. But if we haven't, even if we have, he is the king here. He says, hey, would you like to be my queen? She nods a little, and they go on back to the kingdom. And everything's great. Aside from her being mute and not returning his affection in any way, but apparently that doesn't bother him very much. Until the king's mother, who will be played by... Let's not complicate things, Helena Bonham Carter. Don't overthink it, she'd be fantastic. She's the mother-in-law. The king's evil mother who starts talking a bunch of shit behind her back and says that she's been doing terrible things, and eventually... The young queen gets sentenced to death, but then all of the ravens get turned into the Stranger Things boys and Entourage boys and Shelby brothers and take her out from the fire 
everything works out, and then all at once, they turn to look at Helena Bonham Carter, boil up a bunch of oil, throw a bunch of poisonous snakes in the oil. I guess now there's just a bunch of poison in the boiling oil? Because the snakes are dead. Those snakes are for sure dead in that boiling oil. So it almost seems redundant, but maybe it, it's worse. Anyway, they throw her in the boiling oil, and I guess everything is great then, but no, in the series, this keeps going. We could probably have gotten one or two, possibly even three seasons out of what's happened just up until this point. And then from there, I actually think it's more interesting if Michael B. Jordan deposed the king who was their father and mother, and then, but they're still alive somewhere, and so then we have some dynamics there. No, actually, gonna spin that, they are two kingdoms, except they're kind of at-war kingdoms. And so then we have Michael B. Jordan and his kingdom against F. Murray Abraham and his kingdom. They've always kind of been at odds with one another. They're just on opposite sides of this forest. And so over the course of the next few seasons, we have the different brothers sort of taking different allegiances. And the young queen, who is Michael B. Jordan's queen... So ostensibly, she, you know, is part of that kingdom, even though she's the princess of the other one. She kind of then brings them together because she kind of unites the two kingdoms by being the princess of one and the queen of another. But it's very contentious, and, you know, you drag that out. There's scuffles, there's conflict. And the old lady character is just a wild card throughout this entire ordeal. Maybe she can be kind of an oracle or someone that the queen goes to for advice could be real flexible, you could get a lot of mileage out of the old woman character, the witch in the woods. But eventually, the kingdoms all come together, or at least make an alliance with one another, after a lot of, you know, the brothers sort of turning on each other, and we're probably going to lose some of the brothers amidst all of this conflict. I'm thinking real Game of Thrones style shit, so there's going to be some poisonings, there's going to be some duels, there's going to be some murder, it's going to get gritty. But it can go, that, we can just open-end it from there. Keep a lot going, get a lot of mileage out of that. We get seven, eight seasons out of this thing. Let's do this. I am 100% in. And to do this one right, I think we gotta go HBO. So that's where I'm booking it. HBO series, seven or eight seasons. The next Game of Thrones. Let's do this thing. All right, that will do it for this week's episode of the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Join me next week for a story titled Riff Raff. Once again, that story is titled Riff Raff. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, all that great stuff. It really helps us out. You can donate at ShadowBearStorySessions.com. That also really helps us out. And I would love to hear your own adaptation ideas as well. So send me those on Twitter or Instagram. And that'll do it for this week's episode. Come back next week for Riff Raff. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Mm -hmm.